just want to start by asking a question to everybody. If Java 22 just came out a couple days ago, three weeks ago. Is anybody using that in production yet? Anybody? Okay. What about 21? Anybody using 21 in production anywhere? What did you say? Just starting. Just starting. Excellent. What about 17? 17 in production somewhere? Cool. 11 in production somewhere? Eight? Okay. Cool. I won't ask any more. Hi. My name is Todd Ginsberg. I live in Raleigh, North Carolina. I'm one of the uh, organizers of TriJug, which is the uh, triangle area of North Carolina, which is Raleigh, Durham, Chapel Hill. Uh, if you're from the area, come and say hello to me. I've got about 29 years of professional experience. I've been putting Java in production since version one. And I'm currently the lead engineer for payments at Deutsche Bank in our Cary Tech Center in uh, Cary, North Carolina. No. But thank you. I, I need this. I do have a co-host. He couldn't make it because he slept through his alarm, but uh, my dog Charlie helps me with this, this talk. Every, when I develop it, I, uh, I, I take him on walks and, and read little bits of it to him, and he's, he's a really, really good listener, and I felt like he deserved some credit for being here, for, for helping me with this. So today we're going to do, um, today's mostly about structured concurrency and scoped values. We can't understand those effectively without understanding a little bit about virtual threads. So we'll go through virtual threads and we can't really understand the context that all of these work in without understanding project Loom. So we'll do an overview of Loom and virtual threads. Then we'll get into structured concurrency. Then we'll look at scope values. And just if I could ask you to hold on any questions you have until the end, we're gonna have plenty of time at the very end to ask questions. I'll, I'll happy to answer anything at the end. All right, so project Loom, let's get into that. I'm not going to read this to you. This is the, the mission statement for Project Loom. The important part is that this is the part that everybody seems to focus on, this easy to use, high throughput, lightweight concurrency, so virtual threads. This is what everybody seems to focus on when they read this statement. But there's this other thing at the end down here, this, and new programming models for the Java platform. So these two things I'm going to focus on today, these aren't changes to Java the language, these are additions to Java the language. These are things that ship with Java, you can use them or not. If you don't like the way they are, you can write your own implementations of them. And when you graph out what is in Loom and you ask people, this is basically what that graph looks like. But if you zoom way, 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 way in, you see there's two other projects here. They're like, see, they're, they're like right down there in the corner. <laughs> and that's what we're covering today. So Project Loom is a timeline. I like to delineate time as when the Java virtual machines came out. So across the top, you'll see from left to right which Java version things happened in. So it started in January of 2018, right before uh, version 10 came out. And version threads, version, the virtual threads came out uh, in preview. They were in preview for a couple of releases and re released with Java 21. Con uh, structured concurrency was incubating. Uh, it's in previews now. Uh, and scoped values was uh, released for incubation in 20 and is, is also in incubation. And as for what's coming in 23, I don't know. I've looked at the 23 page. I was furiously reloading this this morning to hope to get uh, a better answer than, oh, um, but here we are. So we don't know what that's going to be, but I'll give you resources at the end so we can figure out uh, what the next step for, for these, these parts of, in Java 23 is going to be. Okay. So virtual threads. So when you create a thread, before virtual threads, let's call these platform threads. When you create a thread in Java as a developer, what you're doing is you're wrapping an operating system thread. Now this is a very gross simplification of what's actually going on, but when you create a thread, you're going to the operating system and you're saying, hey, I need you to create this resource for me. And if you're on Linux or Mac, you can, there's only a certain number of them that that operating system will give you per process. On Windows, this will apparently just keep giving them to you until it runs out of memory. Uh, I don't know which one of those is better, but uh, that's what happens on this anyway. So the problem with this is uh, it's a slow process. You've got to come out of the Java process, you've got to go to the kernel, you've got to ask for a thread, and it's got to set aside memory for the stack because we don't know how long that stack is. And if you've seen Java stack traces, you know they can get quite large and you have to set aside a decent amount of memory for them. So this is what takes up system memory, it's slow, it's a, it's a process. So the problem with platform threads is let's pretend time goes from left to right in this diagram. If I have a platform thread and it's doing some useful work, it's taking up the CPU, 
cool, that's great, I'm using the thread for what it's intended for, but then let's suppose I'm waiting for something, I'm waiting for bits from a network, or I'm waiting for a file to load, or asleep, or anything, right, that I'm not doing productive work. And then the thread becomes active again. This area in the, in the middle here, this yellow, is not optimal. This is a complete waste of time. This is using a precious system resource that uh, I, could use, I could do other things with that. The problem with, with Java threads are that they're memory hungry. Like you gotta go to the, you gotta set aside time for the, the stack, or memory for the stack. They're slow to create. Uh, they're completely useless when you block them and they're overhead for context switching. So when the processor needs to switch from one thread of execution to another, there's a delay uh, that the processor imposes on you there. And then like I said, there's a limit, depending on the operating system you're on, there's a limit on the, on the number that the operating system will give you. And there's just a functional limit to how useful they are once you get beyond a certain number anyway. So what is virtual threads giving us for this? Let's expand our worldview a little bit and we're gonna change what we call these threads here. We're gonna call those carrier threads for now. And let's suppose we've got a bunch of virtual threads. Now these aren't operating system, these aren't bound to operating system threads. These are created on the heap. These are just normal Java objects that are created on the heap. So you can create one in, in an instant and it takes up a couple of hundred bytes because we can expand that stack as we need it. We don't, we don't need to have uh, an operating system reserved one to one from a virtual thread to an operating system thread. And the way these work is when they have work to do, they're mounted on a carrier thread. Uh, and they take turns. If other virtual threads have other things to do, then different ones get mounted on the carrier threads. You can't access these carrier threads. So when you're using a virtual thread, you don't know anything about that underlying carrier thread. And as developers, you shouldn't care, OK? This is a, a diagram going from left to right, again, about how the mounting and unmounting process looks. I won't go through it in, in detail, but you can see when um, when virtual threads become in a runnable state, they can get mounted onto a carrier thread and executed there, and then unmounted from the carrier thread when another, and another virtual thread can take, take its turn on that carrier thread, which is a platform thread from before, a real operating system thread. So this is a, a much more efficient use of that rare, uh, the rare platform threads we're calling carrier threads. There's a, a, a much better way to use those. So I don't want you to think of virtual threads as, uh, sorry. You can also create platform threads. They're not going away. You can put them, you can say, I want a platform thread for whatever reason. There are definitely valid use cases for still wanting platform threads. Uh, don't go off and change everything to virtual threads just because I'm yammering at you about it uh, or because it's the, you know, the cool new thing. Uh, you can still use platform threads. But I want you to think of virtual threads as tasks. I don't want you to think of them like we have been thinking about threads as long running threads of execution. I want you to think about these as tasks, about short lived things. You create them, you use them, you throw them away. They're practically free, so just use them that way. Start thinking about them that way and start thinking that there are basically an infinite number of them, okay? So the thing that virtual threads gives us, this is the same API that we've been using for literally decades. So Java Lang thread, it's not changing, thread's not changing, they're not changing, they're not altering the way that anything works uh, for you. Much, much lower memory requirements. They're limited by the heap memory because we don't have to go to the operating system. We can create as many as we want. And it's much quicker to create these. And it makes a better use of the system resources with the diagram of the mounting and unmounting. All right, let me show you what I mean with the quick creation time. Did that show up? Excellent. Okay, so I've just a little bit of housekeeping. This is just um, my my brand new laptop died on Friday, so I'm using a, a backup. Uh, so hopefully this goes well. My main method is really simple. All it's doing is creating a thread and calling go. Uh, there's nothing to it. I'm just doing a lot of bad exception handling here that you probably shouldn't do in real life. You don't need to worry or care about what main is doing right now. We'll make a change to it later. That's kind of fun. Uh, log, literally just logging. It just says here's the thread ID and some message just so we can have clean output. And then go is our, our main our main thing here. So let's, um, let's start by timing what we're doing. Uh, start equals, and we're gonna create some threads. So we're gonna say, int range, come on. Uh, 
Heck. Sorry. It's embarrassing. Thank you. Thank you, whoever mentioned that to me. Saved, you saved the day. I'm a little nervous. Uh, so we'll say we'll create 10,000. And we'll start them up. Uh, we'll map, we're gonna map them to objects. And we'll call them I because we can. And we will say thread. Of, of platform, so we'll create platform threads. And this is another new thing, this is the builder that's on top of thread that these are, these are, um, are added to, so we can, we can create threads with this builder, we can set that it's a daemon, we can set its name or groups or whatever normal things we, we already do, we do in here. So we can create those and we're gonna call, we're gonna create them in a started state and we are going to uh, call thread, we're gonna write the worst the worst implementation of a clock that you have ever seen. Okay, so every second of time is just going to have its own thread and it's gonna sleep until it's time to wake up and then it's gonna emit the time and then go away. Um, don't create a clock like that. Uh, this is just kind of for fun. So we get a thread.sleep. We're gonna sleep for i number of seconds. That's gonna complain about that. And we're gonna surround with try catch. We are going to ignore the fact that we're doing anything bad with that. Just don't care about the exceptions for now. Uh, I could never remember that one either, so we're going to do that big long string there. And we'll put these all in a list. This is a great addition, by the way, to Java 16 or whatever came out. Um, not having to do the collectors off a of stream, just being able to say list. Okay, so now we're going to say log. We're going to see how long it took. Nope. And then we're going to start, then we're going to join them all. Okay, when we run this, we're going to see this takes a really, it starts doing this. So it took two seconds to create 10,000. I'll stop the, the worst clock in the world. It took just over 2,000 milliseconds to create uh, 10,000 platform threads. And if I create, uh, you know, if I do this to, to 20 or 30,000, it's, it's gonna get worse. It's just gonna chunk along. If you get to up to 50, it takes like a minute. Um, but we can do a virtual threads and run this again. And we should see this coming, there's 108 milliseconds. That was like practically instant. And so we're, you can see we're creating these. We can create a clock that goes very far into the future. We do 100,000 of these, right? So we can just keep going and going and going with this and it will, you know, 400 milliseconds. So we're not even at 10,000 for the other one. So we can do, you know, a million. So even on this eight year old laptop, uh, that has seen better days, it only took me 1.3 seconds to create a million virtual threads. Okay, you just, you couldn't do that with platform threads. Uh, you couldn't do that with platform threads, period. And you couldn't do that uh, in that amount of time, certainly. Okay. Uh, go this way. Okay. So again, I want to show you the, the project charter and I want to, I want to highlight that this, this, this high throughput is the, the thing we're after here, not so much latency. And why are we after, what is, what is giving us this throughput? Little's Law, has anybody heard of Little's Law before? Anybody into, like really into queuing theory and Little's Law, a couple people, cool. Okay, so let's suppose you have a store, like a physical store, it's maybe easier to think about as a physical thing, and you have a pretty steady stream of customers. So their arrival rate, if you've got 10 people arriving in some period of time, let's say an hour, 
and they stay for latency in this case, they stay around for, uh, let's say, 30 minutes each. That's kind of some interesting store. The, you, you, on average, will have five people in your store at any given point, right? This is what Little's Law is. And so, in a steady system, you can think of arrival rate as throughput, and using the magic of math, if you solve for throughput, there's only two ways to increase throughput. There's to lower latency, or there's to increase concurrency. And that's what virtual threads are giving you, okay? So this is why when we talk about virtual threads, we're not talking about latency, we're talking about uh, concurrency because of Little's Law and what virtual threads give us. So the final thoughts on, on virtual threads, don't pull these, okay? Just use them and throw them away. Like seriously, don't, don't pull them, okay? Just create one, use it, and then dispose of it. Just treat them as, as tasks that you, 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 you gotta change the way you think about writing programs to use these. And then just be open to the way, new ways of writing concurrent code. So when, when, we, when I show you structured concurrency, especially you'll see the difference, these things are gonna be a lot easier to manage. So places where you wouldn't have considered using concurrent code in the past, you may wanna consider it now if your use cases make sense for that. Okay, let's move to to structured concurrency. And to understand structured concurrency, you need to understand unstructured concurrency. You need to understand what we, what we have and why we, what we want to get away from. So, oh, let's do this. Okay, so let's try an example here. We're gonna create, um, we'll create these things. Let's create several, couple helpful methods. So we've got public, private, uh, string, Succeed, actually, so this method will eventually succeed. Um, so we're gonna say, how about we spell things correctly? And I take my glasses off so I can actually see what I'm doing. Okay, so we are going to eventually succeed. So we're gonna thread dot sleep. Oh, this looks good. sleep for a little bit. We will wrap this in try catch because we don't care. We will log about to succeed. And we will call, the success in this case is gonna be calling our very important data. So we've got a very important data service here. So we're gonna call, um, and we're just gonna get one of the very important data, which in this case is a list of Simpsons characters. Um, and then we'll log that we were interrupted here. Okay, and then because the failure case is almost exactly the same, we're gonna cut and paste. And we'll call this one fail eventually. And instead of doing this, um, we will say we're going to fail. And we will throw a legal state exception, intentional failure. Okay, these will help us show the problems with uh, unstructured concurrency and how structured concurrency helps us. And then while we're here, let's um, let's create one that just never does anything. So that's. Sleeps for one second. Come on. Half the keys on this keyboard don't work, so <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, and of course, we want to put this in a thing. And we're going to, again, we don't really care. This is just demo code. We're not going to handle exceptions. And we're going to uh, log. So another bad clock. Okay. After all that, we've got an executor service up here with a fixed number of threads in it. There are just three threads in it, just to show you what's going on. And so we're gonna say, we're, getting, we're gonna submit two things of work to this, right? So var f1, so future one, these are futures. I'm not gonna type out all the names. Uh, and we have executor service dot submit. 
And we'll just do runnables because why not? And we'll say succeed, eventually, duration of, we'll say that succeeds in two seconds. And we'll create two of these. Uh, and we'll have that one take four seconds and we'll go uh, two. And we will print our results. say f1.get, so in a future when you say get, it means wait around block and wait for the answer that is being computed in the executor service in some thread. And, okay, so we run this, this should work, right? You're gonna wait basically four seconds for an answer, but we're gonna get it. So you see thread ID 24 succeeded, 25 succeeded, and then we say Todd Flanders, that's funny, and Cletus Spuckler. I didn't know that that was Cletus's name until I made this list. Uh, okay, so no problem there. This is great. This is what we use futures for, but what happens when we fail on this in two seconds? And we'll, we'll exaggerate the success case just to show off what we're talking about. So what is, what's happening here? So we're gonna run this. This will run. Failure happens. Go, the, the exception that gets thrown is already outside of Go. Go is done, we've already returned from Go, but success is still running. The succeed eventually thread is still running, and it returns an answer that we don't care about. So we've bled a thread, we've lost that thread for abuse, it's still being used in the executor, but it's off, off and doing whatever the heck it's doing, and we don't get a chance to use that thread. So this is, this is waiting around, worst case it's waiting around for work that we don't care about. Now, to be fair, Java has attempted to make that a little better. So we can do, um, and we could say new, new virtual thread task right here just to show you that too. So this is a new executor that also comes with um, with, with uh, I think Java 21, right? So this is a new executor. It just creates a virtual thread every time you submit something to it and it throws the thread away when you're done. Uh, so that's a nice handy thing. And so this is, this is similar. Oh, that's still fun, that's still running. Okay, so this is very similar. Um, why didn't that work? Oh, because I did this. Okay, actually run actually show you what's going on. And so, sorry for all the scrolling. It's not that we get this nasty exception and succeed goes off and does what it's thing and, and go, go has returned. We get the, we get the, um, we get this in sort of a, a, you know, quote unquote sensible order. So we've seen, we, we have a fail condition and we have a succeed condition. And then we, we realize that we, we don't, we don't care about the result, right? Because we need both of these things. But because fail has already happened and we're waiting around on success, we are just completely wasting time. We wasted eight seconds there waiting for something that we don't care about. And in real, what we really would like to have happened is that work to get canceled and us to return immediately. And this becomes really tedious. And I tried to come up with a succinct, a succinct demo for how we would cancel this reliably. And I can't, I can't do it quickly enough to make it go through it. But you could wait for an exception from one of these and cancel the other, and it's just kind of a big manual pain in the neck that you have to deal with, because I'm not. The other fun thing is, what happens if um, this, the thread that, run, that Go is running in gets canceled? What happens if that thread gets interrupted? So we'll go down here to main, I said not to worry about, now we have to worry. And after we kick off our, sorry, get rid of this so we can actually see what's going on. After we kick off our, our thread that runs Go, we're gonna say, um, we're gonna sleep for like 400 milliseconds. We don't, how did it do that? Uh, just to give Go enough time to get started and submit some work, 400 milliseconds seems to be a, a good time to do that. And then we're gonna interrupt, interrupt T1. So that thread that kicked off Go, we're gonna interrupt it, and then we're gonna, um, just gonna log that we interrupted. T1 is interrupted. 
probably. Okay, so what happens when we run this? Same thing as before. Interrupted, so we've interrupted Go. Those two things are still off doing work. Even if they both succeeded, it's a complete waste of time because we know we've interrupted that thread. We don't, we don't really care about the answers. Again, these are things you could do. We could catch these things, we could cancel the work, we could do all these things. It's manual, we have to do it, we have to remember to do it, we have to do it correctly, we have to test for it. It's a colossal pain in the neck. All right, so let's get rid of that. I wanna show you one more thing and we'll move on. So it's convenient as developers to think about tasks and subtasks as having some kind of relationship with one another. But in reality, this isn't true. Um, so suppose we have a child method. And it's gonna basically do the same thing as this, so we will copy this, because why not? And we won't do any actual work in here, we'll just return some very, some very important data um, like this. Actually, you know what we're gonna do? We're gonna do executor service dot submit. And we'll succeed eventually. And we want this to run for a really long time. Just so I can do something else. Okay. Make the type checker happy. And we don't want to call fail eventually, we want to call um, child. Yes, sure. Why not? Okay, so what's going to happen is we are creating, we have a one thread, it's creating a child process and it's, and it's running that child process, it's waiting for the answer from the child process and then it's printing it out. That's not exciting, right? But it's only there to show you the, demo, the to show you the relationship uh, between these two threads. So we'll say JPS, which is Java Pro show the show all the names of the Java processes on this machine. And we're down there at the bottom of the list. So we'll say JCMD 16632. So we'll say for them to file format. JSON. This is new. So instead of these thread dumps that you're used to with the you know, since the dawn of time compact format, this is a nice JSON formatted, uh, JSON formatted document. You just tell it this is unstructured, so we'll just call it ons JSON. We'll run it, that's not that interesting. Uh, we can cancel our job up here. We can come back up here and look at, look at this thread dump. So this is actually pretty nice looking, and we will start collapsing these. Actually, you know, let's not, let's look for child. So we see here's child, and its root, its parent is root. So some root thread in the system, thank you. Uh, we don't know where this came from. There's no, there's nothing that shows us where thread 24 comes from, right? And then there's go, is thread 22, has nothing to indicate that it has a child. There's no indication that these two things are related because they're not. This, this relationship only exists in our head. There's no, actual relationship between these two at the JVM level. Because imagine in a situation where we had a lot of these threads, a lot of these conditions where we have a parent and a child thread, you wouldn't be able to track these things just through stack traces. Okay, so that's it's an important thing that um, structured concurrency is going to fix for us. Okay, so the three problems with unstructured concurrencies, like I just said, the relationship between tasks and subtasks, they don't really exist, they just exist in our head. Observability is difficult, so if you wanted to track a bug in child, uh, having to debug through all that would be very difficult. Uh, and then managing work is difficult. Uh, if we had code in there to handle, properly handle exceptions and properly handle work that, you know, failures and canceling the rest, and that it just gets really tedious, and there's a lot of code to avoid common things that we should just be doing automatically. So now we can talk about structured concurrency. Structured concurrency is, is like, as a formal concept, is actually relatively new, uh, especially since structured programming is a somewhat old concept from the 50s. I was surprised when I researched this that structured concurrency has really only not even been around for 10 years. 
and a couple of languages already have this. So what is it? It means that subtasks have well-defined entry and exit points. So I'll show you in a second what I mean by that. And there's a strict nesting of task lifetime. So a child cannot outlive its parent in this case. Um, so here's a, a piece of code that pretty straightforward. It does something. It calls a first method. It calls a second method. And it jams the results of that together and returns the result to the caller. This is nothing crazy. This is just um, you know standard structured programming. So the first thing that happens is you call first method, and it's really easy to figure out what's going on in this, right? So first method was called from example line 22. This is a, a, an, a relationship between the parent and the child task. If you view this as parent and child task, that relationship is immediately apparent. It's very easy to debug this, and it's very easy to debug where that came from. The next thing that happens is second method gets called, and then we return that value to the caller. Now there's a lot of things going on in here that we as programmers just kind of take for granted. Like what if first method fails? What if an exception gets thrown? What happens? Nothing. Nothing else happens, right? We understand that implicitly. Why can't we have this for, for, for concurrent code as well? So the goals in this, I'm not going to read this to you. That's cut and pasted from the, from the, the, uh, the JEP for uh, structured concurrency, but it's to promote a, st a style of programming. So what I'm going to show you isn't something you have to use. It's just to show, hey, these things are possible. Structured concurrency is a thing, and we can do it. Maybe people will build things on top of this for Java. Maybe people will use this directly. Maybe people will come off and say, I don't, I don't like the way that, that, that Java has defined these, and uh, we want to write our own. So maybe those will happen, and that's all, that's all fine. And then it'll preserve the, improve the observability of concurrent code. And to do this, we have something called a structured task scope. It's a lovely gray box. So let's suppose we have uh, a scope and we've put several tasks into the scope and we kick them off and we say, go, go do your thing in separate threads uh, and we'll wait for you at this point here. We join, so join means wait for, the, wait for the tasks to finish working and let's suppose they all work, that's great, and then we'll interpret the results of the tasks. That's all normal. This is just like the first example I showed you where things just kind of worked. Now what happens if this task on the end, troublemaker, here on the end fails? These tasks all get canceled. The scope will cancel these tasks for us. We don't have to do anything. We just have to pick the right implementation of the scope in order for us to get that for free. This is preview. What I'm gonna show you is, is preview in Java, so you have to enable it with uh, enable preview, which is a well-named a well uh, command line switch, I think, in terms of Java command line switches, right? They're pretty tedious sometimes. This one's actually pretty good, uh, I think. Okay, so let's look at what I mean by this. This demo should go. Okay, so what we want to do is we want to look at the success case first. So, so we're going to say there's a structured task scope. And we will say, um, we're not going to use it directly. You can use it directly, and I'll explain why in a little bit, why, when you would want to do that. But we'll say shutdown on failure. This is the scope implementation we're going to choose. And this, what this shutdown on failure does is any task that is submitted to that scope, if it fails, everything else gets canceled for you automatically. Okay, so S1. Uh, it, so the earlier implementations of structured task scope, when you submitted work to it, it would have returned futures, but that was changed in Java 22. It now returns a, a structured task scope thingy. We don't particularly care about that. I'm not going to go into it because we're not going to really have time, but uh, I just wanted to show you that it's not, it, I don't want to show you, I just want to let you know that it's not a future, but it, it's kind of like a future. So we're going to fork, um, and we'll call succeed eventually. Of uh, seconds uh, two. And we'll do that again. Come on. Let's say that we'll admit that pause for two seconds. We'll call this S2 and we'll join. We'll say scope.join. And if there was an exception, if one of those forks failed exceptionally, and that's bad. It sounds like it failed exceptionally. It sounds like, yes, you're exceptional. Um, but in Java, it turns out that that's bad. Um, 
So if that happens, it'll just throw an exception. You won't get, and you won't have to do. It won't run any more code for you. Uh, you can do that if you want. Otherwise, you can handle these. You can test the scope to see if it failed and do whatever you want with it. In this case, I don't. I don't particularly care. So I'm going to just. I'm just going to do it this way. So we're going to say log the answer. This one. Uh, come on. Come on. The one key doesn't work. I don't know if you figured that out. Plus, I can't really type. And so we can call get on here. This isn't going to block because we've already joined. The join call here is what's blocking. That is the, the gets. The gets are free. We don't. We don't have to block on this. And when we run this, we'll see thread 24 is about to succeed. 26 is about to succeed. And we get Kang and Selma Bouvier. Cool. Okay. So now, what happens if one of these fails? That's that's, you know, interesting. But what happens if one of these fails? Um, Run this. We don't have the problem with that we saw with unstructured concurrency because what happens is um, 24, thread 24 is about to fail. The scope immediately interrupted the success arm of that of that fork, right? So this thread 26 was about to be interrupted. We get the exception, we printed it out because we don't care about exception handling for the demo. But this was nice. We didn't waste time. We didn't waste those extra seconds waiting around for work that we don't ultimately care about. So I think that's pretty cool. And I didn't have to do anything. I just picked a policy and we just went with it. Like, I think that's pretty cool. Um, what were we going to look at here? We can switch these policies around. So there's a shutdown on failure. It comes up with another one, shutdown on success. And it's typed because you can only have one success. We don't really care uh, which one it is. So we can get rid of these. We don't care about any of that. And because scope, because the success can only come from one, one fork, it'll pick the first one that succeeds and it'll hand me the result. This is nice if you do any resilient, there's a resilience pattern called hedging where you can send requests to two systems at once and like just look, use the first one that comes back. Like if you've got an address correction service and, services and one is slow and one is quick or one, you know, you can farm that request off to two things and take the first answer that comes back and cancel all the rest of the work. This supports something like that. So we'll say thread.join, scope.join, sorry, and then we will say scope.result because there's a single result. So we'll run this and we will see that fail, fail, but because we are looking for a success, this will succeed, we get Darwin, Dr. Marvin Monroe, right? So all of the, we'll show you the more interesting part of that. What happens if, um, if a slow and a fast succeed, right? So only one of these will be necessary. So you should see one succeed and the other one is interrupted. So again, the, the speculative work we did in the other arm of the succeed was, was not needed because the first one returned quicker, so we threw it away. We printed out Santa's little helper as our answer. Um, canceling this. Um, doing this again. I should have just commented this out. I don't know what I was thinking. We'll just run this. If we interrupt the thread that they're running in. Can I get you at the end? Thank you, my friend. So at the end, so we, um, we ran that thread in Go. We interrupted it almost immediately after it kicked off some work. And, we in, and, and because that thread was interrupted, the scope understood that, hey, I'm interrupted. None of the work I've submitted that, that has been submitted to me is worthwhile completing. And so those, those were also interrupted. So they, they, that gets cascaded down for free. We didn't have to do anything. That just happens no matter which one of those scopes we're using. And then the other thing I would like to show you is the parent child on this is really easy to see where this comes from. So we are going to call child, which doesn't exist. I should also add, I'm not going to show you, but I should also add, if you don't call scope.join, this will fail. You have to join, you have to wait here. If you call get before on any one of these things or scope.result or get, you know, get off of one of the, one of the fork results, um, it won't, it'll fail immediately. Like, it'll fail very quickly, so you won't, 
waste time either. So you have you have to join. So we have a child process, and we are going to copy this because we can. There are no rules. And what we're going to do is we are going to scope.fork. And again, we don't really care what this does, so we're going to say tick. Just let it go in the background forever and ever and ever. And we will return something to make the type checker happy. And we'll run this. And so what you'll see is, uh, well, that's not fun. Oh, just yes, of course I'm going to show you not joining. I don't know what I was thinking. <laughs> All right. Come on. Now we do it. This time for sure. Okay, so now we've got a parent, we've got a child that's going off, it's just printing tick to tick, we don't really care. That's not the interesting point. We'll do this rigmarole again, so we'll say JPS because it's a different process number, JCMD uh, 22596 thread dot dump to file format is JSON structured concurrency. Okay, I created a thread dump file. And we'll immediately go find child. What's interesting is child. Now you see this is thread 24. Its owner is 22. Because we're calling, we're calling the structured task scope is this 454B5 of number 22. And there should be another child around here somewhere. There's the other child. You can see it's sleeping because it's calling tick. You can see it's thread number 26. Its owner is 24. Its caller, its parent is this 4B5 scope. And the, the, the scope that this thread is running in is this scope. So I was immediately able to figure out where this work came from and follow it all the way through. If I had um, tooling, I could show this virtual thread came from this one. This which was kicked off from a specific scope, came from this specific scope in this specific place. I can follow that, that completely through. And I think that's really cool. I didn't have to do anything for that. I didn't have to, to, to do anything. Scoped just gives me that for free. And then the other, the other thing you could do is you could, I'm not going to show anything with this, but you could just say, I want to use structured task scope, and it won't do any of the, the special handling. Um, but you can interpret all the results. It'll do the cancel, the work canceling, but once you get to the join point, instead of succeeding or failing, you, could, you can interpret all the results of the scopes and, and do things that way. You can also subclass that uh, and write your own policy. So if there was something that, that the succeed and the fail ones don't handle, if you wanted to handle like ordering the results, or uh, there's certain things that I think are optional if they don't happen in a certain amount of time, but everything else is mandatory within some time, you know, sky's the limit, you can write your own policies. And they're pretty easy. I didn't do one because they do take a significant amount of time to do. And I'm sorry we are to speed this up. Okay, so remember from structured concurrency, there is an explicit relationship between tasks and subtasks. Unlike unstructured concurrency, observability is easier. And then managing work is easier or automatic. We don't have to do anything with canceling. We don't have to care. We don't have to do any of those things manually. Uh, it just happens for us, and I think that's really, really cool. Scope values. All right, who is, who's used thread local? It's been around since like Java 1.2. I would expect most of you have used it or seen it. Thank you, that's almost everybody. You used maybe map diagnostic context logging and log4j or something like that. That's all basically thread local. And so thread local is like this. It's a static map where the key is a thread and some, some value, and it's like, it's basically like a global variable, right? And we're supposed to not like those. Um, so the problem with thread locals is let's suppose we have one called access level. Um, and it's just a string access level and we're doing something this is we set, we can set this, okay? Nothing, nothing controversial about this. 
The problem is, well, I, you know, and I get it somewhere else. I, I, you know, some within that same thread of execution, some some far away place. I get it, and I use it, and that's okay. Uh, the problem is, there's unconstrained mutability in that. Thread local is read and write. I can write to it anywhere. Anywhere in that thread of execution, I can write to that. So I can do something dodgy like this. Not that I ever have, uh, but you certainly could. And I'm sure somebody in this room has, and I'm not gonna ask because I don't want, I don't want to find out. Um, but you can reset that, what that is, and then you can set it back to the original. Literally anybody anywhere can set this. This is a problem because now you don't know who's mutating your state where it's mutating. There's an unbounded lifetime. If I just set this and then do the thing, the next time somebody comes through and uses that thread, they're an admin. They don't have, they don't, if I didn't clear that out, there's nothing that's clearing that out for me. That's, that just lives on that thread forever. So what you have to do is you have to call remove on that. And this is basically how this is done. You do the thing and then you in a final you do remove. But this is something that we have to remember to do. Uh, this is something that should be done for us. We're, we have better things to do with our time. And the, expense, the inheritance can be expensive. So if you, instead of have a thread local, you have an inheritable thread local, any threads that you create from those uh, parent threads, you spin off child threads, they get a complete copy of this giant cache object. Okay, so it's not like there's a shared version of it here. It's a complete copy into the other thread. Uh, so scope values, they help by doing the opposite of everything basically I just explained to you as a problem. Again, in preview, fancy keyword or fancy command line switch, you gotta use it. And I will do a quick demo because I am, I am aware that we are running out of time. So let's say that we have, uh, we'll make this public static final scoped value of string and we'll call it username New instance, easy. And then here we will say scoped value where username is devnexus. Run. Um, some function. Now we can, we can test for this. I know I'm, these are close together. You'd probably not do this in real life, but I'm just trying to hurry through this. So if username is bound, meaning something, you know, I can refer to username whether, whether somebody did something with the where clause up here or not. Um, I will print it. Okay. Otherwise. Come on. Okay, this is not the most earth shattering demo for this. And so it hands that through there, but let's pretend that this, let's pretend that some function is some framework code like Spring or something we can't change. It's some interface, some, some something we can't change. We're just gonna immediately call our, our uh, very important data We're gonna print that out. But in very important data, we control this. The framework's calling code, we're calling framework code that eventually calls us back. This is a really common thing. So let's suppose if I pass in dev nexus, so if example dot username, uh, we'll assume it's bound, we can do this or else uh, equals dev nexus. So if we're at dev nexus, we're gonna return the best Simpsons character, which is the first one in the list. Uh, data dot get first, which is another nice addition to the JVM, to the standard library. So put in your minds who you think I think the best Simpsons character is. And so this will show that I can pass this data one way from, from the caller around the, around the framework code and into my, into my target method, Johnny Tight Lips, obviously the best Simpsons character. That's the most important part of this talk. Um, so this is, in, this is interesting because I can't, in, in very important data, I can't do anything with username. 
I can't, I can't get it. I can just read. This is immutable here to me. I can't do anything with this. So this can severely constrains the use cases, but this is the use case that most of us have and want. And then because we are, we're running out of time, I just want to show you, um, I just want to explain to you, you can have more than, more than one of these. If you have two of them, you can, you can call them. When I'm calling run here, it's not running on a different thread. I'm not submitting it to a pool or anything. It's just, it's just, it's a runnable. Uh, that's why it's called run. There's also um, callables and suppliers. You can pass those in as well. I'm just using runnables because they're easy. And um, these play really, really well with structured concurrency. If I, if I run within a scope, scope value, if I create a scope and then fork things off of that scope, all of those child processes get a cop, they, they share uh, this, this value because it's, it's immutable, they, they can share that. So it's a quick, it's practically free, all of the child threads get this. I can't rename this, uh, I can't alter the name of, of, of the scope, but I can, I can redefine it, all right, so. Okay. Uh, come on. I'm trying to go quick. I got to go slow to go quick. So I can as the scope progresses, I can pass, I can redefine it. Ah, what did I do wrong here? Where am I? Oh, I was trying to show you something and I screwed that up. Okay, really this time? Come on. All right, so it won't print anything out. It'll just, it, I didn't pass in the right value because I redefined it. So I can't, I can't change it for the thread that I'm, for the, the scope that I'm running in with the scope that some function is running in, but if I call something else, I, I can redefine it for things that I'm, that I'm calling. Uh, so, so that's a nice change over, like a, a middle ground between uh, being completely immutable and being mutable everywhere. So things to remember about scope, either a way to pass data one way. You can't use it as like a sneaky return. You can't do anything like that. And then try to use these in cases where you do, um, you have thread locals now, but you're passing data one way, or you have something that makes the, you know, something like what I showed you, um, where you don't need like unconstrained mutability. Try not to use these for caches, like, and try not to use thread locals for caches. Try to use other things. You can eliminate most of these entirely. So remember, both of these things are in preview. And then nothing, nothing we're using now is going away. Like one of the, the things I love about the Java the, the JEP documents is the section that says these are not goals. These are explicit non-goals. And I love that section because they always have something really interesting in there. Like they always say, yes, we understand people are going to ask for this, but we're not doing it. Uh, and I've started using that on all my documents at work too. And it, it's great. It's a great, it's a great section to have. So this is, again, we're not, they're not changing the implementation of threads. Uh, they're not going to make you do anything you don't want to do with virtual threads. They're not going to change executor service or future. They can add on to it, like we said, but they're not going to change them. And then thread local, also not going away. Um, I've hand arranged these dots just for you. If, if you click, if you use your phone, you can go to this URL here. This is the Java 23 release page. You can follow that eventually uh, up until June, I think they'll be adding more and more and more things to Java 23, uh, which will come out in September. So you can follow that to see where these two projects land. Another hand arrangement of dots will take you to the, view, the Project Loom wiki. Did anybody see Char's uh, keynote yesterday afternoon? He talked about how everything is done in the open. This is what it is. This is what that is. So you can go to this page. Um, I think the most interesting thing on here is the mailing list archive. I read this every couple of days. You can go on and see changes, like the diffs that are coming into the JVM. You can talk to the authors of all these things. It's, it's pretty cool. There's all sorts of documentation and thought behind all these, 
all these libraries and processes and all the things about fibers that they tried and threw away. It's really interesting, so, so go check that out. If there's more stuff you want to see, there's two other talks at DevNexus. Uh, while you're still here, you can still go to these. Daniel O and Room A312 at 130 talks about virtual threads with, um, with Quarkus. And then uh, in this room, 305, uh, Meta Chakravorty is going to talk about what is, what's looming in Java. And I'm happy to answer questions afterwards. If you, you want to come up and I'll, I'll answer questions because we are way over. So I'm sorry. Thank you very much for your time and attention. I appreciate it. Thank you.